Welcome to Screen Therapy. I'm your host, Jason Schurz. In October of 2018, I found myself in the hospital, sitting across from a psychiatrist, who was telling me that I was bipolar. I was released with a bunch of medication and laid on the couch for about a week. I had my iTunes library on shuffle, trying to shake the hornet's nest from my head. Ever since I was a kid, I've been using music for therapy and as a way to escape. Punk rock and mental health have always been connected. This podcast looks at that connection through the lens of different guests. This is Screen Therapy. The language of mental health can be problematic. When I was first diagnosed with bipolar, I didn't know whether to say, I'm bipolar, I have bipolar. I ended up settling with, I live with bipolar. Then I didn't know if I should call it an illness, a disorder, a brain disease. It was so confusing and dehumanizing. Sasha Altman de Bruel has spent a lot of time thinking about language in his work advocating for people's transformative mental health through his work with the Institute for the Development of Human Arts and his personal counseling services. Sasha was the bass player for ska punk band Choking Victim in the early 90s and joined the band again for reunion shows in 2015 and 2016. Sasha lives with bipolar. He's been hospitalized a number of times after having psychotic breaks. Rather than using the language of illness, Sasha prefers to use terms like dangerous gifts, sensitivity, and madness to describe mental illness. He strives for freedom, and he believes in people taking back the power and owning their conditions, rather than letting the mental health establishment tell them what they are and aren't. My name is Sasha Altman de Bruel. I'm from New York City. I'm 46 years old. I live in Oakland, California. I grew up in the punk scene in New York that was really based on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And that would have been like the late 1980s and early 90s when I was a teenager. And it had a really big effect on me as a person. Finding punk rock for me was not just music that I love, but it was also the first time in my life I felt a sense of community. I was like always kind of an outcast when I was growing up in school. And for me growing up in New York at that particular time, there were kids from all over, mostly North America, that would run away from home and come live in the squats on the Lower East Side. And so from the time I was 14, 15 years old, I had friends from all over the country who had all kinds of interesting life experience. My parents both lived on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. As a child, I would go back and forth between their houses and they had a pretty contentious relationship with each other. And I don't know, I was like a really sensitive kid growing up. So finding the punks was like I belonged somewhere. And at that particular point in New York, there were all of these abandoned buildings that had been burned by their landlords and then taken over by the city and were sitting there vacant. And so there was this whole movement of people who came and were um, taking over the buildings and fixing them up and living in them. And that was like a very empowering thing. And then there was this park called Tonkin Square Park where There was a lot of really interesting characters hanging out there. And so for me as a teenager, being in that scene, it was really helpful and important. And I would say one of the key aspects of it for me was that the community that I was a part of, rather than trying to kind of fit into the society that we lived in, it was just assumed that if you were normal, if you liked society or if you fit into society, that there was something wrong with you. And that came in real handy when I got my ass locked up in a psychiatric hospital when I was 18 years old. And they told me I had a biological brain disease because for me, I was so kind of embedded in the culture of punk rock and anarchism and like counterculture that 
I was like, fuck you people. <laughs> you know, like, what's that line from that suicidal tendency song? Like, you know, how can you say I'm crazy when I went to your schools and I went to your, your churches, your institutions, learning facilities? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> when I went to your school, I went to your churches, I went to your institutional learning facilities. So I feel like that, that, that helped. And going from the punk scene where, you know, a lot of us were outcasts and kind of shunned by society. How did that change when you went into the hospital? Because I would imagine there's a whole other stigma around that. Yeah, well, I mean, I feel like most of my friends, by the time I was 18, like all my punk rock friends had already been institutionalized. I mean, like for me, it, was like, it, it like came a little later. So sure, we could use the word stigma to talk about it. But I mean, basically what it did was it made me feel an allegiance to the community that I came from. And when I got out, I was living with my mom and got a job at Barnes and Noble at a bookstore and then tried going back to college. But I mean, I ended up right back on the Lower East Side, hanging out at Sea Squat with my friends. And that was a place where I felt comfortable. And that was a place where I felt like I didn't have to pretend to be something that I wasn't. You talked about how a lot of the folks in that scene had already been to institutional facilities and had been hospitalized. What was the talk amongst the scene around that? Was it just put aside or was there conversations about it? I feel like there were a lot of people who were institutionalized by their parents when they were teenagers. By the time you end up, you know, running away from home and, okay, I'll say it like this. That period of time, like the early 1990s, we weren't living in the biopharmaceutical revolution that happened in our country wasn't the same. It was just kind of starting off. So what I mean is I remember sitting around with my friends and it turned out that all of them had been put on Prozac, you know? Um, and this is like years before I was ever put on psychiatric drugs. And that was like the first wave. Like I said, I'm 46. So if I had been 10 years younger, I'm sure that I would have been put on, you know, ADHD drugs as a young person. And you talk to people who are younger than me, and that's the common theme. But I feel like we were still that generation where it hadn't fully taken hold yet. The work that you've done in the mental health sector talks a lot about language. Can you run me through the language that you like to use and the language that you're not fond of? Well, in general, I put the words mental illness in quotes, you know? I even put the words bipolar disorder in quotes, you know, rather than seeing ourselves as diseased and disordered, we see ourselves as having dangerous gifts. Language I do like, I really like the word sensitivity. I think it's really useful to talk about how some people are more sensitive than other people. I really don't like talking about illness or disease or disorder or dysfunction. All of a sudden we're talking about illness. I want to leave space open for people to figure out for themselves what it is that they're struggling with. Like you used the word stigma a few minutes ago. I'm not that fond of the word stigma because I feel like in many ways, stigma is a word that gets used. You know, there's these big anti-stigma campaigns that happen. They're mostly funded by pharmaceutical companies. And you think about it, the people who have the most benefit from there being less stigma, like economically, are, are drug companies. Because they can be like, oh, you don't have to be ashamed you have a mental illness, you know, and take this drug and everything. Will... Society can embrace your mental illness. Well, what if we didn't just embrace our mental illness? What if we like flipped it around and said, actually, the society that we're living in is really sick. What if we start from that place and say the society that we're living in, its foundations are on genocide and slavery and all the things that we think are so normal, you know, like that was just the way that it was. What if we start from that place and say, instead of trying to just fit ourselves in to a society that's really broken, what if we try and actually use the fact that we were seemingly different from the society to try and change the society? So that I got that from punk rock. I mean, I got that from where I, I came from. Stability is a huge thing for folks. For me, almost two years just to get to a semi-stable place after being diagnosed with bipolar for you, it seems like you've had times of stability through your life and a recovery process is kind of a nonlinear thing. 
How have you stayed stable in those times, uh, more so in the last few years you've been there? Well, first of all, if we want to talk about language, I'm honestly not the biggest fan of the language of recovery. I mean, it's just not, it doesn't really do it for me. I'm like, okay, so what am I recovering? Am I recovering and going back to the way that I was before? Because that certainly is not the case. I feel like, unfortunately, after spending a bunch of years working in the public mental health system, I see the way that the language of recovery gets used to keep people kind of, hey, if you're recovered, we don't have to pay for your, your, your mental health care, you know? I think to answer your question about stability, I've had some pretty dramatic psychotic breaks over my, over my life. I was first diagnosed when I was 18. And then there were four more times where I was hospitalized and not just chilled out, going to the hospital things, but like full on, like the police holding me down, shooting me up with antipsychotic drugs. It's been very dramatic. The last time I was hospitalized was 13 years ago. And if, if the question you're asking is, how do I stay stable? I mean, I have some very concrete answers. Uh, my friends and I, over the years, we developed written documents, you know, that these days I call TMAPs or Transformative Mutual Aid Practices. And it's a set of questions that you can ask yourself and ask within your community about like what it looks like when you're doing well, what it looks like when you're struggling. What are the things you need to do to take care of yourself? How do you talk to the people in your life about what you're going through? And that was all kind of modeled after my experience and then the experience of a bunch of other people in my community. So for me, I think I have a really good sense of what it looks like when I'm doing well. There's a quality to my thoughts that are grounded and stable, but I have access to a sense of what it feels like when I'm, we use the language of what does it feel like when you're most alive? When I'm most alive, I feel like looking people in the eyes. I feel like I'm connected to something much larger than myself, that I'm not just like an isolated entity. I feel like I have purpose, that I have like a reason for being. And there's a grounded quality to it. And what do I need to do to, to stay healthy and well? Well, like the basic stuff is I need to get enough sleep. That's super key. I need yep. to get enough sleep. I think, you know, anyone who's like us, who's like sensitive and like a, you know, bipolar kind of way, we know that without sleep, we tend towards chaos and disorder. I need to make sure that I eat good food every day. So that's like a real priority in my life. I make sure that I exercise every day. So I ride my bike up in the hills and I do yoga and there's like a yoga asana practice, things like that. I wanted to get a sense of what your journey looked like from diagnosis until now. In my mind, it goes diagnosis, therapy, and then recovery. I know you don't like the term recovery. So in, in your experience, how did it go from being diagnosed <laughs> to where you are now? It wasn't, it wasn't like that. First of all, uh, once again, this comes as someone who has spent a bunch of time locked up in psych hospitals and is also someone who's like worked in the public system. We do a great disservice if we start with diagnosis, because that assumes that the diagnosis is like, oh, this is when it started. This is when the journey started. When for no one ever does the journey just start with diagnosis. The journey starts way earlier. How did you end? I think it's a much better question to ask like, well, how did we, okay, I got diagnosed with bipolar disorder when I was 18 years old, but what led up to me getting diagnosed with bipolar disorder? You know, yeah, I uh, left home and went to, to college when I was 17. And it was stressful to leave home for the first time and be on the other side of the country. You know, I was smoking too much marijuana. I was drinking too much coffee, throw in a little acid in there. And I had what felt to me at the time, like I had this, this vision that the world was going to end. I mean, I didn't sleep for a really long time. And I, the way I talk about it is delusions or psychosis. It's often like, if you're not sleeping, you start dreaming while you're awake. That unconscious process starts coming out in your daily reality. And that's what happened with me, was my unconscious process. I, I thought that there was 
I thought that there was this like grand conspiracy, but that this revolution was going to happen and that I was going to play an important role in the revolution. And I had to go back home to New York and I went back home and then I thought it was my last day on earth. And so I ended up jumping onto the, the, the subway, like down from the platform down to the subway tracks. And I walked through three stations, you know, and I was convinced I was being broadcast live on primetime television on all the channels. I was like, a re I was having this ecstatic moment, this sense that I was, what was I saying before about being connected to something much larger than myself, you know, that, but like the sense of that, like connection that I was playing this really important role in it and that I was, what I was put here on earth to do, I was doing, and it was probably going to lead to my death, but that would be okay. And so, yeah, they diagnosed me with bipolar. I mean, what would you do? <laughs> you know, and, and uh, back in those days, they kept people in psych hospitals much longer. And so I spent three months in a hospital and was very depressed and was very confused and was 18. And like I said, they told me at the time that I had a biological brain disease, uh, but that it was okay because there were drugs that I could take that would make it better. And my life was probably going to be not, you know, I wasn't going to have as much freedom as maybe I thought. And so that's how I got diagnosed. That's my story of being diagnosed. But what actually happened after that was I tried going back to college. I lived with my mom. I really wrestled with I mean, I put out of my mind what had happened. It was like too weird and I didn't have anyone to talk to about it. That's when I started playing with my friends and we formed that band Choking Victim. And we, you know, I would talk about it once in a while, but mostly I was pretty quiet. I was a pretty quiet kid in those days. I was like very humbled from that experience. And then at some point I had a breaking point. School was really stressing me out. And I didn't want to be in school. Like what I really wanted to be doing was I really wanted to be riding freight trains. <laughs> That's what I wanted to be doing. I Fair enough. To, yeah. <laughs> and so I ended up dropping out of school and I started traveling and that's what I did for like a bunch of years. You know, I was like 19, 20, I guess by that point I just turned 20 and I spent the next four years of my life where I, I just traveled and I worked in all kinds of different jobs worked on political campaigns and just was like a traveling punk kid is what I was. And I was living, those were some of the happiest years of my life. At that point, I understood what it meant to be locked up. I understood what it meant to have my freedom taken away from me. And I was like, I'm not going to let these people take my freedom away from me. I'm going to live as loud and proud as I possibly can. And that's what I did until I got locked up in a psych ward again, you know? <laughs> and when I was 24 years old, they diagnosed me with schizoaffective disorder and I was suicidally depressed. And of all the times, that was the worst one. Being suicidal like that for months, that was a really awful experience. And I could go on, man. I could just tell you like a whole story, but I think the long and the short of it is I got out, got my shit together, got locked up again, and in no way have I ever felt like the word recovery really captured what it is that I went through. Because each time I went through one of those experiences, I learned so much and I gained so much. And I started at some point, I forget when it was, it was years later, but I started using the language of transformation. At some point I was just like, I'm way less interested in recovery than I'm interested in transformation. Because I feel like that's like, we never just, uh, you don't look at, a caterpillar that forms a chrysalis and say, oh, that caterpillar is, you know, in a state of recovery or whatever. It's like that. No, yeah. you, it turns into a butterfly and flies away. And there's like, that's the movement that I want to be a part of. I'm not particularly interested in like a mental health recovery movement. I'm way more interested in like a transformation movement. And maybe we even use mental health language just to be able to get people in the door, but then drop it because it's like not even that, not even that relevant. When you talk about some of the things that you're going through on a day-to-day, -day, whatever cycle of your moods is going on, do you volunteer the information that you're living with bipolar or do you just describe what's going on? I do personally, because I, depending on the context, but in general with my life, and I don't say I'm bipolar. I say like, I've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder 
I often find myself saying like, yeah, I've been locked up in psychiatric hospitals because it sounds dramatic, but it's the truth. And it happens to be, I feel pretty proud of the fact that I have done for someone with my serious mental illness, I've done a lot of things and managed to hold it together. So I, I say it with pride. And part of, I would even say like a big part of what allows me to do that is because I feel like I'm part of something larger than myself, that I'm not just an isolated person with bipolar disorder. I'm part of a movement that's trying to change the whole way we think about what gets called mental health and mental illness. And that's like, there's a power in that that allows me to say all kinds of things that otherwise, you know, other people might find like hard to say. Why did folks who had mental health issues or other marginalized folks find their way to the punk scene? Why did they feel like they were being included, that it was a place for them to belong? Well, I came of age going to squat shows and then going to ABC in Rio, which there were these hardcore shows that would happen every week that were a direct, they were set up because there was a club in New York called CBGB's and there were these Sunday hardcore matinees and they were kind of terrifying spaces to be around, you know? They were really like super macho violent. And at ABC in Rio, it was like a really different scene. It was like the Gilman Street Project in Berkeley, which is part of what like drew me out here to California all those years ago. On the wall of the place at the entrance, it was like no racist, no sexist, no homophobes. I think in general, there's, I don't know. I was listening to the Buzzcocks the other day. The first record, there's a song called Breakdown. I mean, there's just like a million punk songs about like being fucking like madness and craziness is it's not shunned. It's like literally romanticized in punk rock, <laughs> you know, like that's yeah. like the, the nature of it. In 1994, which is when I was playing in Choking Victim, that's when Green Day ended up on the cover of Rolling Stone. And I feel like that was like a really big turning point. That's when punk became mainstream. It had never been mainstream before and I think there's something that happens when you have something that's underground and then it becomes mainstream it holds on to some of the qualities but then it there's aspects of it that kind of end up yeah you can't hold on to it if it becomes mainstream you know so I don't know I was like really hating on Green Day back in those days and then later on grew to appreciate them. But there's some Green Day video that I'm sure they were playing on MTV that was like head case or something, Bas basket case, that's it. There's a basket case Green Day song, you know, and it takes place in a psych ward. And I mean, yeah, madness is encoded in the DNA of punk rock for sure. That is part of the deal. And then how that manifests itself it looks different depending on what's going on. You ever see that amazing video of the Cramps? They were a super early punk band. Yeah, the kind of rockabilly garage. Yeah, yeah. There's like yeah. a video of them at Napa State Mental Hospital here in California where they somehow they had some friend that worked there and they like went and played a show. It was like in the late 70s. <laughs> and, and the lead singer, I forget his name, Lux. Uh, Lux Interior, yeah. Lux Interior. Yeah. Yeah. He's like... They say you guys are crazy, but you seem all right to me. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. As far as your journey goes, where do you see yourself on your journey right now? Well, in some ways, that question about caring about what other people think and then not giving a fuck. I think where I see myself, I see myself as being a mentor to people who are, who are figuring their stuff out just trying in like the most humble way I can helping people figure out where they're at on their journeys in many ways I spent I spent so many years like if you had asked me that question like I don't know 15 years ago I probably would have said something to the effect of I'm here to help bridge connections between people I'm like a conduit between worlds I want to bridge people's life experiences so we can like build something. And I feel like I'm still 
I simultaneously have a lot to learn, no shit. <laughs> and also I've been around for a few years. I have a private practice, so I work with people. That's part of what I do. I'm part of this mental health training institute, and it's less about me training other people than it is about helping to find. I'm still doing the same shit I was doing 20 years ago. I'm like helping to build a movement. And I'm on that journey, and it feels, it feels good. It feels fulfilling. I'm a little scared for the world. I'm a little scared for where we're headed, but I figure we all do our part while we're here. And then hopefully like other people build on whatever we did. Do you feel like a butterfly? Hmm. Yeah, sometimes. The issue with that metaphor, of course, is that we don't just go through the chrysalis stage and become a butterfly and then that's it. It's like, it's a continual, maybe a, one way of thinking about it is that I have lots of different parts and they're at different stages of evolution and transformation. I think a critical piece, something that, if what you're saying is that it's only been a couple of years for you that you've been navigating this world and props to you for like being like, okay, I'm navigating this. I'm going to write a book and interview people. I mean, great. The metaphors that we've been given to talk about ourselves are so incredibly limited. It's just important to like step outside of that and figure out where you might end up finding some wisdom in some realms that have nothing to do with mental health. That's important. What I end up doing is taking things from other places and bringing them into the mental health world. I know we call it mental health, but it's actually just liberation. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of Scream Therapy. I thought I'd tell you a little bit more about myself. I was born in Powell River, a small coastal town in British Columbia, Canada. After my mental breakdown in 2018, I had to take a break because everything seemed impossible. I needed to focus on my recovery. I did my best to take care of my mental health while dealing with the intense mood episodes of bipolar. I'm really glad that this podcast has been a big part of my recovery, and I thank you for listening. Screen Therapy is now airing on college and community radio stations. They include my hometown radio station, CGMP, out of Powell River, CJSF 90.1 FM from Simon Fraser University, Radio Humber from Humber College in Toronto, Ontario, Radio Waterloo, CKMS from Waterloo, Ontario, and Kootenai Co-op Radio in Nelson, BC. You can connect with me at soundcloud.com slash screamtherapy. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, take care and be well. Oh!